Uh, well, hockey, I think you got some Prince tweets here that you want to run through first with scoring explosion. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I mean, so scoring explosion is the offensive breakdown, and and you know we'd like to break down the Northwestern game for you, but I can't think of any better way than what uh, Casey Thompson did on Sunday at the press conference. So here we're going to take a minute out, just watch Casey, and this is a this is the, uh, the a breakdown of Northwestern's defense. Uh, Northwestern is a four down front, uh, also known as even. That's their main front. Um, number 99, is, I think, is their best defensive lineman. He's really good, has a really good motor. Um, they have a couple of transfers, um, and uh, they had one transfer from Stanford. You know, the inter two interior D linemen are transfers. And then uh, they lost the safety, number 16. I think his name was Newsom, uh, transferred to uh, Notre Dame. Um, so they got a new starter back there at safety. But um, they have some, some good players in the back end, but they're predominantly uh, four down front. Uh, they play cover four. Um, and they rotate a little bit. They mix it up, and they'll go one high. They'll go zone and man. Uh, they, they bring pressure occasionally. There's certain situations they like to bring pressure. Um, still studying the red zone defense. And I'm still studying you know, certain situations and formations, but we have a pretty good idea in game plan so far. Um, we used kind of this last week of training camp to prepare and put a good game plan together. So uh, today's Sunday, and I feel very confident that we have a great game plan already going in uh, to Ireland before we get on the flight. Um, but I would say 99. Uh, their defense lineman definitely stands out on film. And then number 11, uh, he played corner last year, the defensive back. Uh, I would say he probably has the best speed over there. I think he was a 10 6, 100 meter track guy, so he has good speed on the outside. So um, I think they have good talent, and it's a good defense, and uh, I'm excited to line up against them. I mean, Dave, the, the breakdown there, you know, number 99, and here's this guy runs a 10 6, and this, these guys transferred out, and these guys transferred in. I mean, Certainly no one's going to uh, accuse Casey Thompson of not doing his homework on what Northwestern has and what they're bringing back. And and uh, even though they've had changes with people transferring and all that, I mean, you know, this is a, the preparation. It's I'm not saying we're the only school to do it, but it's just it's good to see our starting quarterback uh, be able to discuss well, I guess, the defense. I just like hope he prepared for an odd front as well, and we don't have to throw it half the playbook. <laughs> we so, we, yeah. we definitely need to not have the odd front issue. For well, Whipple's going to be calling the game from the corner of the field, so hopefully if Frost is standing in the middle of the field, he won't walk over and take the clipboard from him either. So That's true. Whipple will be on the on the ground. Yeah, but there's like a corner but area. But Chins will be up, up top. Yeah. Oh, is that where Chins yeah, is? Chins, yeah. is Chins will be up. Whipple will be down. I guess yep. it doesn't work as well. Then. But uh, Mac, um, I, I, when I heard that, and I'm, I'm impressed by by that. I mean, a couple of things. I guess I mean, Casey Thompson is he's well prepared. Mm -hmm. um, he has kind of some rote memorization skills, which mm -hmm. he can recall in, in at least a somewhat pressure situation of a press conference. So you'd like to think he could do the same thing on a on the football field. Um, but do you think that other quarterbacks in the past couldn't do the same thing, at least when it counted, which is on the field? Or, or is he just better prepared to say that in front of the microphone? Or was that something they're like, wow, I don't think well, – let's not even say Adrian. Let's say any of our past quarterbacks wouldn't be able to just run those type of facts off. Uh, no, I think I think a lot of our quarterbacks would have understood what he said. And I, it was interesting that he chose to break it down that way. He took the question very literal and, and really broke it down. And it was interesting. It didn't dazzle me. I mean, I figured yeah. he should know everything he said. I mean, that's, that's not super high level, but it was, that's our job. But it was a little detailed for an answer. Uh, yeah. What I like about Casey though, and I think will will show up on the field is <clears throat> him coming from Texas, the, which is also a fishbowl of, of college football. And he was also the quarterback at Texas, which is going to have just as much pressure as a quarterback in Nebraska, uh, if not more. He's not – I don't think he's going to shy away from this moment. I don't think this moment's too big for him. I don't think Nebraska's too big for him. I, whereas sometimes I think Adrian felt way too much pressure. Casey isn't coming in that, with that. I mean, he's he's ready to go. He is locked in. He's, a, he's obviously – a a student of the game and he works on his craft and he's a serious young man. Right? So those are the things that encouraged me about him. That, that breakdown was, was good. It was good. But I mean, I, I don't think that's nothing. I don't think that's something we missed in the past. What I think we missed in the past is his, what his uh, hopefully poise. I think this guy and clutch with, at the end. Well, he's not even clutch, but just, he doesn't panic. You know, there's a difference between clutch and just not screwing up. I mean, and I feel like if we could just get a guy who doesn't screw up, 
And well, we have playmakers around us that I feel like he can get the ball to and, and facilitate, and, I, and that's really yeah, all we need him to do this year. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll let Rob say something quick here, but I, I mean, Boomer or someone just brought up a couple of quotes from from our listeners saying, oh, "Yeah, I don't think other quarterbacks or college quarterbacks could do that, etc." Um, I, boy, I mean that. I mean that, that's how you prepare for the game. I mean, you're you're getting all that information, and, and you're hearing from your coaches, and you're saying they're telling you who to look for, and all that type of stuff. I think it was more impressive that he could just read it off really quick but i mean yeah, he, that is he what game recall. preparation is for a quarterback at the college level and even yeah. at the high school level they're doing that the, the but he's 24 age. isn't he i mean yeah. he's not yeah he'll be 24 in yeah. october yep, yep. And so and he's I, I would be the shocked best. if our other That's quarterbacks right. couldn't have done that are, are you talking about not, other quarterbacks on the team yeah. right now well I, I mean at least you're starting quarterback i mean you you earn that mm-hmm. by by yeah. knowing that right? yeah for sure I think this goes back to to when we had Aaron Sorensen on the show a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about this, and we talked about the kind of leader that Casey is. I mean, one thing you'll notice is he was not elected as a captain to the team, right? Which is kind of rare for a starting quarterback, but he is a transfer, and the black shirts were even chosen from players that are coming back, guys that have actually played on the field for the Huskers, and people who have not played it down for the Huskers are going to have a chance to, to be that. And Casey's one of those guys on the offensive side of the ball, And I think, though, it goes back to his type of leadership because while he may not be the most vocal guy on the field or the most vocal guy maybe in the locker room, he is definitely the most vocal guy when it comes down to breaking down film and understanding and understanding the plays and having that higher expectation for the other guys. I think Aaron said something about that, that like you can tell that he expects a lot more out of his wide receivers. I mean, he even that could be true. And it was when he first came onto campus, what was the first thing he did? He took his offensive line out to dinner, right? And to get to know those guys. And yeah. he was out there in the offseason throwing balls with his wide receivers. Well, they do that all the time. Single- I mean, well, they they're do, not throwing they do, seven but- on seven when they're out well, offseason. That's crazy. I, to me. I know. And, and but just let me finish. But the things that I was hearing, and even from like <laughs> Chancellor Brewington, was like, was My like, brain explodes. He was doing it more than the other guys yeah. in the past. So, so what I would, it, and, I would and that's my this point. Too. Is, yeah, I get it, Rob. He's, he, I guess he's doing it more. I mean, again, it just questions how well we were prepared in the past, I guess. But I would I would pivot a question to, to Mac on this. I was thinking about this a little bit. We've made a lot on, on this show, and everyone makes a, a lot about Whipple as being the new OC. Mm-hmm. But people aren't making as much about the fact that we have a new quarterback coach mm-hmm. as well, right? No one's talking about that. But that that is probably more intriguing to me is how well Whipple has been able to prepare these – these quarterbacks and how well do they respond to his coaching style opposed to uh, Mario's? Well, Mac, you had, you at the 2018 football coaches clinic, you talked with Mario for a good 45 minutes on Mm -hmm. the field there. And, and you walked away impressed with this general knowledge of just the QB techniques. But, but, but I think we grew tired over years. It was very much about the biomechanics and even Mario would say that, you know, oh, I don't really know what play we're running or anything like that. I'm just looking for foot placement and how he spins the ball. I'm like, yeah. well, that's not really enough for your salary, but okay. <laughs> I and mean, also, you've only developed the one guy and only very slowly. Well, and I always thought the, the role great. that Mario, really the skill set that Mario brought to the position was more of an analyst totally than a, than an a analyst. coach. It, it, like To this day, yeah. I wouldn't even mind if Mario was still on staff as an analyst simply breaking down the techniques of the player, and that's all that person yeah. dealt with. He literally has a PhD in that, but that's a whole different thing from coaching and and, and scheming and how do you, you know, th- th- there's other things you want out of a QB coach than just how to throw a sidearm. In fact, I remember you walking away from that talking about, yeah, you know, he talked about how you threw off your back foot and did all these things, and it was – it was they practice certain ways to to throw off your back foot if you were in that position, you know, mm-hmm. and still get the ball downfield. The problem was that at times Martinez was throwing off his back foot and d- doing those throws when he shouldn't be, yeah. when he should be stepping into a pocket. And four years into it, he was never going to be a pocket passer by the, by the end of the, his time here. Which it, I, it's possible that everybody's better off on that that split. Mm-hmm. Right? Adrian might be better off in K State with a different offense that doesn't rely on More him so much. In a, in a different personnel package and a different QB coach. And that's the same thing here at Nebraska, right? It's really intriguing. Mm. But, you know, to Rob's point, I mean, like when you talked to Brewington too, I mean, look, these these receivers, they've certainly, they've taken to Casey at, at the very least. And it, and it was very clear for what it's worth, Whipple took to Casey right away too. Whipple, who had been recruiting Purdy for a number of years, you know, even during his time at Pitt, I mean, the, from the very first spring practice, he was sitting there saying, yeah, you know, Casey's the guy. 
and every re, every receiver. I mean, they were pretty much everyone has said from day one that Casey is the guy. Well, so he's it, been able to said step the in. The competition's and, been good at quarterback, and at the same time, Casey's pretty much led the entire time from from so, day one. So that's good to me. It's it's not like I, and the running backs are a poor example, but like where there hasn't been any separation in the running back room. But running backs are a different position in general because you're going to yeah. play more guys. But <clears throat> Casey has clearly define himself as a starter and you've also heard that the backups are playing really well too so that's that's good mm -hmm. you know whipple whipple does develop quarterbacks he develops quarterbacks and he also develops them in within the offense which is something that Verduzco couldn't or didn't do mm -hmm. he just developed their throwing mechanics and how to get the ball out and getting their stroke right and all this other stuff which i loved you know that was cool it sounded great until we didn't win any games ever you know <laughs> and then i was like well this isn't gonna do it mario <laughs> well, that's yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you, someone said earlier uh, too big for him that the game's not too big for him. I've got to show this tweet here since we're on the offense. Um, look how <laughs> small can't be right. No, this is true. Is there this a is, curb this, there? I mean, like uh, there might be a curb involved in this, but this is Teddy Prochaska in Wonderland. This is, is he per, walking to the end of the hall. This I is Prochaska like looking down. <laughs> so last week, last week when I had um, Rob Zask on and we were talking and Rob mentioned Teddy Prochaska. And he goes, he's 6'10". Well, I'm sorry, it's Rob Zaska, so I have to say it. He goes, well, he's 6'10". Right. And he goes, actually, he's 6'11". You know, Rob's got like the deepest voice. Yeah. And um, but he's like, he's actually closer to probably 6'11", even. And That's you look right. at, and he goes, he's just a mammoth man. And I mean, Frost is not a small Frost dude. Frost is 6'3". You make a line over his shoulders, then 6'3". <laughs> So you're saying seven more inches? Yeah. That's, so nah, that, for all the for all like the podcast feet. list, no, this is I, this is from you, the World Herald. This I, is not oh, a okay. <laughs> Great. Great. Let me tell you something. Frost is at least two or three feet behind him. They are not even. Frost okay. does not look like a dwarf. There, there might be a curb there. That See that yeah, line? It looks like there a might hobbit. Be a, it might be a six or eight inch curb that like Scott's walking in the street Something's and they're walking wrong on the with sidewalk. Agreed. Prochaska is huge. There's a picture of the offensive line. Like and, everybody's huge there. Yeah, it, they all look huge. They all like Ben Hart and Prohaska. They, but you would think those two guys would stand out, but they really don't when it's their whole yeah. line. As Cole just said, there uh, it, clearly there's a curb too. But and for the uh, for the podcasters tomorrow, they're just listening to this. We are looking at a tweet from the World Herald, and it's from Dublin. And Frost is walking right alongside. He looks like Kevin Hart. <laughs> He's <laughs> so so short compared to a. Uh, the Brock and stuff, but um, but like you know, hey, guess Frodo what? Maybe Baggins that's walking with right. Maybe that's in a Gandalf. Maybe we can kind of move from quarterback to offensive line. We're going through positions, so let's talk okay. offensive line here. Um, Rob, you had a chance last week. You were watching some of the uh, Zaska uh, discussion, the the uh, fan form that I did with him, and he talked about the offensive line being a run blocking offensive line. In fact, he had he had concerns about the pass blocking side of it, but he he thought the run blocking was. Uh, uh, a, a level of strength that we have. In fact, really? that, you know, we had guys that could move Ty Robinson around. He goes, that's not easy to do. Um, when you hear that, Rob, and that's our strength, what would you do if you were Whipple and you're calling an offense? Well, since they listen to the show, um, I would say that I do exactly what they did the following day and talk about the practice they had the day before and how much better they were getting at pass blocking. So, oh, okay. yeah, um, that's funny because I, I, I heard that. I'm, I was laughing and I almost texted it, but then all I would get back is shut up, Rob. So I didn't do it. But um, no, I'm actually excited about it. We have some we have a really good stable of running backs this year. I mean, there's four guys out there that could be starters on just about any team out there, really. And I mean. Yeah, here's here you go. Here's a poll where Anthony Grant's gonna be the starter. Great job, guys, because that hasn't been said about any from any of the uh, media out there at all, right? Well, um, so Rob, but, what, what is this poll? That's the most. That's the most. The poll is who will be at the most rushing yards versus Northwestern. And, and what's what's interesting is, I mean, look at the breakdown of this. It is overwhelming. With and now we have like I don't know five hundred some votes on it, but mm -hmm. but Anthony Grant is number one. But I mean, I mean, read off the the stats. Yeah. I mean, it's by far. Yeah, it is by far. And again. I, I've always said it. I think Yant's going to be a, a short yardage kind of guy. Um, and, you know, especially in the red zone, that's where Whipple's offense tends to uh, be a little bit more run heavy. And they had, like I said, they had 26 rush touchdowns last year at Pitt and they were all in the red zone. <clears throat> so they didn't have a, they didn't no bust out a whole lot of run plays. That's right. That no explosive that run good. plays. I know that doesn't sound that great, but the fact is, what is it? A third of their touchdowns or so were scored in the red zone, running the ball, and Yant is that kind of guy. 
So, and I also think that we'll have our offensive lines not going to be terrible this year. I think that I actually think they're going to end up being a lot better than people think they're going to be. So based off of what Rob, I just based off of what, well, because it doesn't seem like when the coaches are talking about that, they do focus on the run side of things. And it almost seems like they're purposely avoiding talking about the passing side of it, because obviously that's a focus for a lot of people when it comes to Whipple's offense. So it's almost like a, I'll say yeah. it's one of those, what do you call it? A, uh, like a redirection. I, I think we're going to run the, their answers. Yeah. I think we're going to run the ball a lot more I than what people that. think we're going to do. And I think that we're taking, I think we're taking too literal of jumps from what he did a year ago in the ACC with a pit team with Addison at receiver and, and pick it at quarter, third year quarterback. I would throw the ball as Zaska said, I'd have thrown the ball 75% of the time with those guys, with right, that, right. with that lineup. He doesn't have that lineup here. In fact, he has a lineup that uh, aligns itself a lot more with running. And I'm not saying, in a, in a, I'm not saying we're going to run 65% of the time, but I think we're, we have a, a run heavy offensive line and that's at least early in the season. I think we're going to rely on that. Nothing helps pass blocking I mean, better than really good run blocking. Yeah. That, I think this is one of the most intriguing storylines of the entire season from an offensive perspective is what mm -hmm. is the actual kind of like, uh, you know, run pass ratio, especially mm -hmm. when it really, really counts because yeah. I mean, you look at Whipple's offenses in the past, he, he likes to throw the ball. Scott Frost likes to throw the ball, but mm -hmm. I mean, yep. if we believe, uh, you know, simple or other kind of insiders that have a, a lot of connections within that program, it does sound like that um, the pass blocking has been, you know, left something to be desired in, in this, um, you know, uh, fall camp. And that doesn't mean it can't get better as the year goes on. But I mean, I think the best way to make your pass blocker blocking better is to run the ball effectively to mm -hmm. uh, have short, short passing game and play action deep. And, you know, I heard a stat today with Casey Thompson at Texas last year when he had good protection. I don't know exactly how you define that, but like he wasn't pressured. You know, they have all these stats now where you are you pressured or not pressured on mm -hmm. downs where Casey Thompson throws the ball and he was not pressured. He had a 22 to four TD to INT ratio. It's not bad. Two to well, four. He also has a very that. quick release and doesn't that, I mean, that's going to help the offensive well, line Well, it's too. because yeah. when he is pressured, he struggles. It is not good. And so <laughs> at least that's what the data tells you from Texas. When he gets pressured, Casey throws picks. All right. Yeah. So we, no, this... we, we, sh we as a coaching staff or they as a coaching staff, however you like to think of it, needs to be able to game plan around that. They need to be able to protect Casey Thompson and no matter what that is. And I think the, the basis of that would be a good run game to start. And then it's going to be easier to protect him after that. Good yeah, run I said, game. I did say once that I wouldn't be surprised they opened this game with 10 straight runs. Yeah. I think. Well, yeah. a, a good run game to start. Um, I've said from day one, I wouldn't be shocked if we ran an option. Now, for what it's worth, in the one practice, they showed it, meaning they wanted to show it, but they were even showing triple option. So, it, it, it nothing else that's in the playbook. And we have quarterbacks that have the mobility enough to do it, but also move the pocket. We also have a little and depth, too. We have some depth, but, but move the pocket. Get, you know, we can move. Casey out of there. There's things you can do. And I'm interested also it, anytime in spring or in fall camp, when one side does well, that's great. Except now it's, well, what's wrong with the other side? So our offensive line has trouble blocking against our pass rush. What if our pass rush, and we'll have a chance here, uh, you know, this weekend and we'll get to this and throwing the bones, but like Garrett Nelson, he spent time talking about Northwestern's left tackle, Peter uh, Skaronsky, who's an all American. What if he goes out and has success or O'Shawn Mathis does against that guy? And also we're like, well, wait a second. Maybe we actually have a good pass rush. Maybe it's not that our offensive tackles who, if it's Ben Hart and, and uh, Prohaska are our tackles, those are two top 100 recruited tackles coming, you know, all American tackles, four star guys coming out of high school. Giants. Giants. <clears throat> um, maybe they're not terrible. Maybe they're going up against a really good pass rush too. It, it's <clears throat> hard to say, right? I, hopefully now this is, this is a little bit of, I'm not going to say Kool-Aid, but just uh, optimism coming out is that I'm hoping we have this offensive line that's that's improved that's going up against a defensive line that has a, some real strength now to it. I mean, some of the, the transfers they brought in and the guys that have developed over the years, Garrett Nelson, all that. Hopefully we've had this, these battles that have made them both that much better that by the time we go and we play Northwestern, they can show it on the field that they're both pretty good sides of the ball. But that's the hope. I mean, Northwestern's good enough that they will be able to, to show us as frauds right away if they if it's not true. Oh. But think how much better they'd just be if they just didn't commit stupid penalties. 
Well, that's you, the clean. That's the clean. You game know what I'm part. saying? But like, they could be. That would improve the level of play so much because you wouldn't be putting yourselves back against okay. the wall so early in tries. So I've said it. I've, I've, I've a broken record on this. The Oklahoma game last year, first two game plays, we had the pre-snap penalties. Right. It was first and twenty. We talked about the quarterback earlier and who's a is he a leader or not? Is Casey a leader? If Casey's on the field and we have two pre-snap penalties and it's first and twenty before we even get our first snap against uh, uh, Northwestern. How does Casey respond? Because that's one knock I would have on Martinez, who was a four-year starter. If you go back there and watch, I mean, where's the where's the guy sitting there going, enough, dudes? I mean, you know, how would Tommy Frazier, how would a great former quarterback leader have acted on the field if if we're sitting there not playing clean football, yeah. jumping off sides and doing dumb things? You know, this that's where you need – what kind of leadership do you have then? So um, – but, you know, I mean, we've talked QB, we've talked offensive line, we've, we've talked a little bit with the running back there, and I do want to just show that poll again. Who will have the most rushing yards? Uh, Redcasters, you, with 55%, you think it's Anthony Grant. And then what's interesting to me is how close these numbers are. Gabe Irvin, Jacques Giant, both 15%. Ramir Johnson actually had the third highest percentage. I think Ramir Johnson had the most total yards of any of those guys. Well, he's at 13% for, mo for most I mean, rushing receiving yards. receiving, too. But, but the way that they can put him out there as a receiver – the way that Yant, I think, can come in as a big back and situational. You know, how often do we get into two back situations where we have two running backs on the field? And it can be in totally different situations. Sometimes they can be in the same backfield, or it could be just moving, you know, Ramir out into some kind of a slot position. What are they what are they calling that? The the, the wide back is what the, is what they're calling him there. That's right. Um, it's a perfect opportunity for the Huskar. <laughs> to finally <laughs> the get that wide Husker. back. But to finally back. get the Huskar that you, that you wanted for thing. so long. That's silly. Um, That's a silly name. But, uh, you know, so I wouldn't call it a wing back. Why not just call it a wing back? So the last position, I guess we haven't talked about yet on offense then is the wide receiver spot. And just like there's a lot of depth there on the offense or on the running back side, wide receiver. I mean, let's go to that depth chart here we had for offense. Um, we have Trey Palmer, Omar Manning, Marcus Washington. We have those listed as our three starters. Um, Alante Brown, Isaiah Garcia, Castaneda, and then Oliver Martin, uh, right behind him. Uh, when we had Aaron Sorensen on a couple weeks ago, she basically said, Yeah, she agreed with that top six in some order. It, it, there could be, you know, varying, you know, but that about, could be dependent on the, the play call for the first. first absolutely. Play, you know? Well, Dave, if you look at that, no matter what, there's Palmer and Washington, there's two transfers right away that yeah. we have listed as starters. So we thought when Joseph got here, we thought he was walking into a really good wide receiver room with Manning and Xavier Betts and, you know, Oliver Martin, all those guys. We Lance thought he Brown. was he was so blessed to walk into that, but he came in there and right away, in addition to that, not only did is Betts no longer here, but he brings in Palmer, he brings in Washington, he brings in uh, Garcia Castaneda. Uh, you know, he recruits the coldest. He recruits a, a, a Bonner, the kid from uh, Georgia there. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's not like uh, – it's not like Joseph has just sat on his on his thumbs there and said, "Nah, we're, we're good." You know, I mean, he's he's been working it to to increase the the talent there on for day one here. Yeah, absolutely. Who do you think leads us in yards receiving for the season or just this weekend? For the season, I think Palmer. I want to say Volkolik. Do you think Volkolik tied in? I think it's tied in. Good call, Mac. Maybe we'll see. Could be Volklex the the captain out of the, of course, the only prediction has been wrong every single year ever. <laughs> but whatever, you know, this is the year. <laughs> I I think Palmer can be a big big play receiver for us there, or, or or Washington. I think Manning, where I really see Manning being at his best is if you go back and watch the Oklahoma game from last year and the way they used him in that more as a possession receiver, big body guy yeah. coming across the middle. He is he's going to be a challenge if they try to cover him one to one with with. Outside right linebackers top. or safeties. Yeah. I mean, that's it's he's just a mismatch. He's a good run after the catch guy, too, though. He's so big. Yeah. But he also he also is getting challenged left and right every day by Joseph. I mean, Joseph sent a photo out a week ago saying these are my guys, and it was all of his re receivers in his room, including Ramir was part of it, and Omar wasn't in the photo. And and he's been the guy that's been called out multiple times about like, hey, we need him practicing two times in a row and three times in a row. And so yeah. um yeah. I think that's part of the just the transition there.